Yeah, good evening. <laughs> good evening. Welcome uh, to this live uh, Facebook chat. Uh, we're glad to have this opportunity uh, once again to dialogue with you. And hopefully this evening uh, we can address uh, some of your uh, major concerns. So we want you all to log in. I've got this great commissioner with you here this evening. I want her to introduce herself. And, uh, and you all log in. We're going to have a great evening, great conversation, uh, wide open conversation. We want to hear from you. I'm excited to be here. I'm <laughs> Commissioner Brittany Thornton representing District 10, Hamilton High, all the way out to the Getwell Corridor, and everything in between. So traditional South Memphis, um, lots of gyms in District 10. Good to see you, Commissioner. Good Glad to, to have you here. Good to see you again. Um, Come on, we want you all to log in and uh, we want you to participate. Uh, we're excited about this evening and hope you'll be excited. Okay, Commissioner, we're so happy to have you here this evening and I want you to know that you are part of the next generation of leadership for this great city. And I'm just so happy that you're here this evening. We're gonna have a great dialogue and uh, Hopefully we'll have a lot of people coming here in your generation uh, to ask us some questions. Before we get started, I want to do just a few housekeeping things. You know, since our last telecast, uh, I met a lot of people and they said, Dr. Harrington, we wanted to call in to ask you several very specific questions and we didn't get a chance to do it this time. So what I want to do before we get into the dialogue, Commissioner, I want to kind of respond to those issues. Yeah. The, the first one was, it's a Dr. Harrington, you did not prepare a succession plan. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> I did not prepare a succession plan when I was mayor. Okay. That is one of the major reasons why I'm going back as mayor to complete that. I recognize that in our population here, which is a very diverse population, there are a lot of young people that are well prepared to give leadership to this city in some very important positions. So looking at the whole landscape, looking at the next generations of leaders, mm -hmm. I felt that it was incumbent on me to come back and to address that issue. Mm -hmm. So it is part of my plan. And let me also say this. Uh, amusingly, some of them said, well, Dr. Harrington, when you win, are you going to run again? Look, let me make this emphatically clear. <laughs> I want to be your mayor for four more years, OK? Beyond that, you need a new mayor. Someone, hopefully, in your generation <laughs> will emerge. But Harrington wants four more years to get this city back on track. So the succession plan, we're going to develop that in the next session. Um, that's one of the issues. The other one, I've had people that say, well, Dr. Harrington, we've had all of these candidates to come to our church, and we don't see you at our churches, okay? So I, I want the, the audience to understand, and, and this started with me after the first campaign. Well, you know, when I got into politics, uh, Harold Ford Sr. really was a dominant political figure, and they took me to a lot of churches to make speeches, and I never really felt comfortable uh, merging politics with church. Mm -hmm. So when I became the mayor, I made it a part of my practice that I would only go to church to worship. I do not go to church to try to induce people to vote for me. When I go to church, it is a very serious undertaking. And my purpose in going to church is to worship, is not to seek voters. You will notice all of the other candidates are coming to your church. I just want you to know I respect the church, and when I come to the church, it's only to be worshiped, not to be recognized as a politician seeking votes, okay? The other question, there is a big debate about the state funding for the sports venues in Memphis. And there's a constituency that want to make the Grizzlies and the FedEx Forum upgrade a priority. There's some that want to make the refurbishment of the stadium uh, for the Tigers a priority. Then there's AutoZone, and then there's a sports complex. 
all of these initiatives, and I want to applaud uh, Mayor Strickland. Mayor Strickland gave leadership to get in the state to make a significant investment in Memphis to enhance our sports venue. But here's what I want to make crystal clear. Uh, it was under my leadership that we were able to recruit the Memphis Grizzlies to Memphis. It was under my leadership that we built a $250 million state-of-the-art arena. So, when I go back as mayor, it will be a part of my priority to make sure that we keep the Grizzlies. So to me, the priority is upgrading the FedEx Forum and making sure that the Grizzlies remain in Memphis. Now, I support the university. I support their desire to upgrade the stadium. But if there's adequate funding, and hopefully we can do it all. But I want everyone to know the priority for me is keeping the Memphis Grizzlies in a state-of-the-art facility. Um, what's the other one? Oh, I gotta tell you this, uh, Brendan. <laughs> People said, Dr. Herringer, what about all these polls? <laughs> and I wanna speak to the fake polls. It's very interesting to me. Uh, one of the candidates hired a public relations firm to do a polling. And the poll was slanted and said that this individual was winning. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a farce. Mm -hmm. Then we had another candidate to come up with a poll that shows he's leading. Yeah. And that's a farce. And I want everybody to know, of all of the polls, the one that I give the greatest credibility to was the Emerson College poll I believe it was WREG that sponsored that. Mm -hmm. That poll to me had more credibility in terms of its, its methodology and its reputation. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that I give a lot of. But all these other fake polls showing that different candidates are winning, when in reality, we are winning. I just want to speak to that, okay? <laughs> now, uh, Commissioner, <laughs> we're glad to have you here. Uh, uh, why did you vote? You did. Who did you vote for for mayor, by the way, if I may ask? I haven't voted. You haven't voted? I vote on election day. Oh, you vote on election day. election day voter. Okay, well, well, since you have not voted, So you can you, still win me over. Okay, so I got to work <laughs> on you. Do you want to tell, uh, you want to tell our uh, viewing audience, uh, if you can, who are you going to vote for? Listen, I'm, <laughs> I'm here. I'm down for Doc. I'm here for Harrington. Okay. Easy. Well, you, you need I, to tell these, these people that why. Why are you for Harrington? So Who is Harrington? You know, I told you this. When I first met you, I was a young elementary student at Hanley. Yeah. Miss Ruby J. Payne was my principal, and I can just remember you and um, Harold Ford Jr. coming <laughs> through our school at different points, and y'all were these larger than life figures. Like, yeah. um, it arguably could be like the first, like, glimmers of hope for me as a future politician. But I didn't piece it all together then, but I remember you and I had very fun memories of you and um, really remember growing up in a more connected, stable Memphis. And so now, you know, mm -hmm. this is not the Memphis that I know. And when I saw the candidates and I kind of sized up what my options were, there wasn't confidence that I had. And yeah. so I did my due diligence. I tracked <laughs> you down, okay? Ask him that story, okay? <laughs> I want everybody to know this young lady is a member of the Shelby County Commissioners. She is a young commissioner in your first term, I believe, first right? First term. In your first term. And Just finished uh, my first year. She grew up in the mound. Yeah. Uh, that's what we call it. Y'all call it Orange Mound, it's the mound. <laughs> So we're glad to have her here. Uh, okay, uh, were you ever undecided? Now, we want to know because, I mean, you got uh, you got some people that say Harrington's too old. You got uh, one candidate that says he represents the next generation. So yeah. can you tell us what was really going through your mind before you had to make a decision? So I waited, you know, until the, the deadline Mm -hmm. to really even speak to who I was considering because I wanted to know who my final options were. You hear all the rumblings about yeah. who's going to get in and who's not. So after I sized up my options, you know, it was an easy decision for me, but I had to like sit down and meet with you. 
because I wanted to make sure that you knew (laughs) that for me, this election, you know, considerations for my generation, those are really pressing for me. And so Mm -hmm. I appreciate um, you for taking time (laughs) to meet with me, to hear, you know, and give context. And um, after we met, it was a it was a solid yes for me. So that was that was useful. I have working relationships or have had working relationships with the majority of the other top candidates. And so okay. um, there was there was context that I had. So I, I weighed all options evenly this election. Okay. Well, Brendan, someone said that third question there uh, is yours. So you want to raise it with me? Yeah. They said it's yours. Yeah. Okay. So what are two things that I would say to other millennials about the importance of this election? Okay. So I'm a millennial. We're three generations apart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, I would say, you know, this election, um, we really need to think about our futures. We, I was thinking about this the other day. Mm-hmm. Um, like, if you're a trailblazer, you can go back on the path that you created. Yes. And I think that for me, it's time sensitive because mm-hmm. I'm 34. Yeah. And, you know, I've experienced the past eight years of this current administration. And it's been rough, you know, <laughs> in the times when I should be in my neighborhood of choice, which is Orange Mound, I live in Orange Mound, enjoying my time. It hasn't yeah. been enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It really just hasn't been. And so for me, this idea of already giving up eight and potentially giving up eight more, mm-hmm. it's just a it's a no-go for me. So I think that, you know, in all things, you have to decide what your self-interest is. But I think that for my generation, we're missing out on a lot during a time where we should really be benefiting and just enjoying things that so many people have had the opportunity to enjoy. When I talk to my elders, y'all talk about the glory days and, and great experiences and, you know, living in community that just mm-hmm. offer so much more. Okay. Try living in Orange Mound right now. It, it's not the same. <laughs> so I just think that, you know. Let me, let me, let me, let me uh, and when I had the pleasure of meeting with your group, yeah. that was a great experience for me because uh, I wanted to make sure that we were connecting yeah. on what is of critical importance as you your generation moves forward because we're in turbulent times. Yeah. Well, you would agree with that, right? These yeah. are very turbulent yeah. times. You're 34 years old, I'm 83. So obviously I grew up when Memphis was segregated uh, and public schools were segregated. Mm-hmm. We rode on the back of the bus. Police brutality was rampant. We got hand-me-down books from uh, white schools and uh, we were the last hired, first fired, all of that. So that was a culture I grew up in, okay? And we didn't have the elected officials that were black, Mm -hmm. okay? Like in your generation, there's so many blacks that have been on the county commission that have come before you. Mm -hmm. During my era, I was always breaking barriers. Mm -hmm. I was always the first, Mm -hmm. okay? So your generation, you've been able to look at trailblazers and all of that, and we've paved the way for you. So one of the important realities that I would like to establish as I involve myself with the millennium is that I feel that it is a duty that I have as one who's paved the way to plant some seeds, to help to create a platform, and that's why this succession plan is very important to me. When I go back as mayor, I will be looking for the best and the brightest in our diverse population to join a management team and to get them ready to take Memphis to a whole new level. But right now, right now, and I don't want you to think this is self-serving, Memphis is is at such a crisis, critical crisis, okay, that we do not have the luxury of selecting a neophyte, any neophyte, or any individual who's not equipped broadly, Mm -hmm. I'm talking about with the the knowledge, the management skills, the courage, the strength to move Memphis forward. Mm -hmm. You already know crime is a major problem here. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's gonna take some real tough leadership, it's gonna take some tough resolve, it's gonna take uh, someone with the ability to take a platform of power Mm -hmm to move change all the way up to the state legislature. Mm-hmm. For example, you may have been a part of that. We had a delegation to go to Nashville 
you know, seeking some reforms on gun control mm -hmm. and all of that. What happened? Yeah. Nothing happened, am I correct? Nothing happened. So someone in leadership has got to have the strength of conviction, and got to be collaborative, mm -hmm. but it's all got to make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got to get you guys ready for that. Yeah. You got to get ready for that, to yeah. turn Memphis around, and uh, I want to be a part of that. That's and good. I hope you'll help. We do too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me ask you this, uh, Brenda. I was over in your community, Orange Mound. They had a parade yeah. about a couple of weeks ago. I know it's very interesting. Uh, uh, I think all of the candidates were on vans and they were riding cars and buses. So we had a little episode, which was great because it, it permitted us to do what I really wanted to do. Yeah. You didn't know that we walked. Yeah. I don't know how far I we walked. No, 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 no. We walked. We, we we shook hands, we hugged so many babies. I heard you couldn't even, you couldn't even we get We couldn't through. even get through the crowd, <laughs> but the candidates, uh, they were riding floats and in cars, yeah. but uh, the 83 year old was trucking it, <laughs> shaking hands, different streets. Oh, we're meeting people. Yeah. And these are the people, uh, they're the ones that make a difference, Brittany. Yeah. It's the real, it's not the bougie. Okay, it's not the power elite. Yeah. Okay, if you look at the uh, what's going on right now, there are a couple of candidates. They got all the money. We don't have much money. They got money power. Mm -hmm. We got people power. Yeah. So always rely on people power. Yeah. Uh, money will not buy the votes. It'll put you on television. It can get you the best staff, the right position papers. But at the end of the day, yeah. The people who vote. They gotta trust you. Yeah. They gotta believe in you uh, before they will give you their vote. Mm -hmm. And that don't cost you any money. You know what that costs you? Is being reliable and doing what you say you're going to do mm -hmm. and working in the interests of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you are, you, I think you have a, a great uh, uh, base of potentials. Um, I'm so impressed with uh, how involved you are in your community and you care. And we got to have elected officials that really care about the least of these, yeah. the marginalized people. And I see so many in your generation too, and I'd like you to speak to them while you got into politics. Uh, some of them get into politics because they want status. Uh, they want to be recognized. Uh, they want power. I don't know. But for me, politics provides you with the platform to serve to empower other people, not to be served and not for self-empowerment. Mm -hmm. How do you view your role as an elected official? I, I'm an organizer. <laughs> okay. And so for me, it's been great to go from the neighborhood into neighborhoods. And mm -hmm. so I'm in my scale up right now where I'm able okay. to like really um, take up to a whole different level what I was doing at the community level. So um, I'm all about neighborhoods. I don't know if we talked about that, but yeah. my love of neighborhoods has really um, turned into my passion here in this role as a commissioner. And then just my fair access. I mm -hmm. feel like where we're at right now, I've heard you talk a lot about the elitists, and Absolutely. I see that a lot. Yeah. I think classism and, mm -hmm. and yeah. the black community is really toxic right now. Really and is. a lot of people just don't have access because too many people mm -hmm. get their foot in the door and let the door close. I so you have people right. who are passing by mm -hmm. opportunities because they never knew that it, or know that it exists, but mm -hmm. on the other side of the door is someone that looks like us. I got you, okay. And I just think that, you know, that's a part of my responsibilities to make sure that we have fair access and processes that work for everybody. Okay. Well, well Brendan, let's talk about this, this upcoming mayoral election, okay? okay? let's talk about it. Let's talk about it, okay? Uh, I've been privileged in this campaign to work with some very bright young people. Yeah. And we've done some analytics, okay? <laughs> we've done some analytics that we want to share with you and our listening audience. You may or may not know, and I believe, I believe it's correct. I believe as of yesterday, there are about, what, 36,000 uh, registered voters in the early voting process? Okay. About 36,000, okay. So I want to correct That's the mis- That's so low. I know, well, hold up now. It's consistent with the early voting in 2015 election mm -hmm. and in 2019. So we're on the same page. Yeah. In fact, it's just a little bit ahead, okay? Now, 
I'm forecasting that by Saturday, we will probably reach, we'll reach at least 50,000 early voters. Okay. And in the last election of 2019, I believe it was 56,000. And typically the early voting uh, population uh, is equals in the, uh, uh, the final election, okay? So it's been estimated that about 100 to 110,000 people will actually vote in this election, okay? okay? Now, so the, the voting trends is that we're just slightly ahead of where we were at the last election. So people are voting. Okay. So what we want to do this evening, if you have not voted, go out and vote. The vote is a precious right that many who came before you paid the ultimate price to have the right to vote. So we encourage all of you to go out to vote. When I showed you those analytics, it was real interesting. You could see that, uh, what was the age group, 18 to 24, and those 24 to, what, 35? You saw on this bar <laughs> that they are not voting. Am I correct? But why? Okay, but let's get it. But, but can you, do you know they're not voting, am I right? The younger voting population is not voting. Maybe we election. wait for election day. Okay, maybe you vote. But at this particular point, they're not voting, okay? So, but those individuals who are 50 and older yeah. are the majority voters at this particular time in early voting, okay? Mm -hmm. Did you also know that the largest cohort of voters are African American and female? Did you know that? Do black women like you? Yeah. They've always loved me. <laughs> I've always got this preponderance of the votes. That's been one of my base. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we feel good about this election. We feel very good about it because historically, the African-American voting population mm -hmm. that's 50 and older and the African-American female have historically supported Willie Harrington. Yeah. And they're gonna do it again. Yeah. They're gonna do it again. So the early trends are indicating that all of our analytics, and we've broken the data down into precincts uh, and I want you to know that the black voting population is exceeding the white voting population at this particular point, okay? So you, you feeling, feeling oh, pretty good? Oh, no, I, f I feel real good about the election returns. Uh, I don't think this election is going to be close. Um, I don't think that the black vote is going to be divided uh, the way some people speculate it is. Mm -hmm. And I think the white vote basically will kind of be divided, subdivided. I think uh, I think Paul Young will get a sprinkling of white votes in the midtown, in East Memphis, and the downtown, mm -hmm. which the white voting population is about 12% uh, of the overall, okay? And I think Mr. Bonner will get a few sprinkling of the white votes in the East Memphis. But the voting population in the black community will not be divided. Mm -hmm. The heavy black vote will be go to Willie Harrington. This yes. is what we, this historically has been that way, and that's what we think will happen at this time. I think the other uh, candidates will get uh, uh, very small percentages of the votes. And at the end of the day, I just predict that we will win overwhelmingly uh, with the black vote. I've really been gauging energy on the ground. Okay. And yeah. people are very much so. I've, heard, I've seen a lot of people turn over to your campaign. Yeah. People who were gung ho about another candidate or trying to, you know, hedge their bets with another candidate. Mm -hmm. They they feel the energy shift. And so mm -hmm. I'm really taking note of that. That's good. So how do we see this thing all the way through? What can people do to well, help support? Well, let, let me tell you what's going on. First of all, we don't want people to rest on this momentum, right. okay? Uh, we got to get this ball across the finish line. Yeah, we do. And I believe on Saturday, uh, well, I know we are, we're going to have a major event this Saturday at our headquarters, and uh, that's at 1925 South 3rd. You've been there before. Yeah. We're going to have a citywide canvassing. Okay. Uh, we had one last week. How did it go? I think, we're, I think we were in uh, Cordova. We were in Raleigh. Uh, we were in the Douglas area, we were in Whitehaven, we were in Westwood. Uh, we didn't go near Boxtown, did we? We went, we went 
and we went to the mound two weeks ago, okay? Yeah. So we're gonna come back. This week, we will have citywide canvassing on Saturday, and we're just gonna go all over Memphis, canvassing neighborhoods, letting people know that Willie Harrington is running, Willie Harrington is about to make history again. Yeah. If they go out and vote, we're gonna turn this situation around and we're gonna move Memphis back to the city that we all love. I like what you said. Years ago, streets was clean. They said we were the cleanest city. We, we had a clean neighborhood. I'll be honest with you, <laughs> the, the city's imagine. dirty now. Yeah. Potholes, okay? Rundown housing, neighborhoods. We have gotta take Memphis back to a respectable status. Yeah, for sure. So I wanna encourage people to come out. Citywide canvassing, come out uh, this coming uh, Saturday. We want you to come out and join us, and we're gonna come all over Memphis. So I have one more question for you, you ready? Yes. What are your plans to get guns off of the streets? My plans to get guns off the street. Well, first of all, let me, let me say this. There are three branches of government, and you've heard me say this before. There's the executive branch, which the mayor is the chief executive officer of a city. There's a legislative branch, which is in Nashville, and there's a judiciary, okay? Mm -hmm. Those three branches of government have to be in concert in dealing with the gun violence and all of that, the bail system and all of that. Yeah. <coughs> I agree with uh, Mayor Strickland. We ought to be concerned with the fact that it's a revolving door. It is a revolving door. But at the same time, there's a Tennessee law that prescribes certain rights that people have when they're incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So what I'm simply saying to you, there is no simple solution to this until all branches of government decide that they're gonna work together to deal with this gun violence. Mm -hmm. And that's what we gotta do. Uh, right now, this partisan politics, uh, the state legislature, as you well know, is Republican controlled, is very conservative, but it's not helping an urban city like Memphis mm -hmm. that's plagued with crime. So we gotta somehow or another come together and, and deal with the ugliness of this problem. Mm -hmm. And I wanna give leadership to that as a Memphis mayor. Do you think that there's a relationship component to how we should approach crime and safety? Because that's been a concern for me. Okay, it's, tell me what you mean when you say a relationship. Well, yeah. you know, I'm coming from the neighborhood and yeah. I, re I see how we're now having generational poverty be at play. Okay, yeah. And it just seems like sometimes somebody's, some of the candidates' approach seems a little more punitive, where it's just about the criminal okay. rather okay. than addressing okay. you've come from a disinvested uh, community. Gotcha. I'm you've glad been... you brought that up, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you, and you may not like my position on this, <laughs> because I've had to respond to this. Uh, Brittany, uh, I came up in segregation. Yeah. I came up when we were going to the cotton field, uh, picking and charting uh, on a cotton chopping bus for three dollars a day. Hmm. Uh, so I came up on a hard time. My mother and my grandmother raised us. Uh, I'm the first to get a, a high school diploma, first to go to college, okay? So I was able to break that generational poverty cycle. Then my kids were able to go to college. Now my grandchildren are going to college. So here's what I've been telling people all of my life. Mm -hmm. We have to do this family by family. Okay, I don't know your history. I don't know if you're first generation college grad. See, that's, that's interesting, you are. And uh, you're a young lady just in your 30s. And as your life evolves, and you decide you want to have family, well, you will be the first generation to break out of it. Mm -hmm. And the succeeding generation should be better. They climb on the success of the previous generation. Mm -hmm. So what I've been saying to people is, what we got to do this is uh, family by family, breaking the generational poverty, and, and it's going to take decades. Mm -hmm. It's going to take decades, okay? Then we got some reforms. I mean, it's... Uh, this, this uh, school to prison pipeline, that's got to be broken. Uh, the income uh, wealth gap between blacks and whites. What part but all of this, of this would, is long term. What part of this would I not like? <laughs> well, the, I'm connected okay, with all of this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that, no, what I was getting at is uh, 
uh, and I'm not critical of the millennium, I, I think when you all cite those particular problems, it kind of gives you an escape. And let me tell you which is what you won't like. I'm the kind of guy, and I grew up, okay, I'm gonna take it whatever way you give it to me, mm -hmm. okay? No, I got to struggle. So bring it to me. I've been telling people, if you think racism is going to evaporate and go away in America, no. So what am I supposed to do? I'm going to cry because somebody don't like me because I'm black. They deny me opportunity. You know what I do? Every door that I got through, I had to kick it down. Mm -hmm. I had to walk. I had to be prepared. I had to be smarter. And I had to kick the doors down. Mm -hmm. That's how I became superintendent. Mm -hmm. They didn't give us the mayor's job, mm -hmm. okay? We, so when, people, when young people say that to me, it's kind of a crutch. Mm -hmm. So if the guy, like I said, that's what it is. So what you do, you, you take the struggle and that ought to make you harder and make you have more resiliency because those who came before you had to struggle. So it's not gonna be easy. I'm looking at America today, I see America reversing back, mm -hmm. turning the clock back. I've heard that a lot. But I'm, no, I see that. I've lived long enough to see us turn the clock this way, and now I see it being turned back. Mm -hmm. But am I just gonna say, hey, that's what it is? No, that means you gotta be harder. Mm -hmm. You gotta struggle more. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Citywide canvassing. <laughs> I want all of you to come out to the Harrington campaign this Saturday, man. I'll tell you what, last Saturday we hit some neighborhoods, man. We want people to come out from 11 a.m., join me. And I want you to remember this. Now, I know there are a lot of candidates. There are 17 that are running for mayor. But in a crowded field, I want you to ignore the rest and vote for the best. And if you vote for the best, You'll vote for Willie Harrington for mayor, a proven leader. Thank you for joining us this evening. My candidate. You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Bye. <laughs> Thank y'all for tuning in. Go vote. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely Brittany. amazing. Uh, Brittany. <laughs> was that Brittany that did that? I kept running. I kept watching Brittany. I kept watching. trying to figure out. What's the tough part you wasn't going to like? I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean about me? No, like, I'm, I'm, I'm literally but, listening. I'm like, okay, I agree, I agree, no, but what I I'm, agree. What, what I was like. really saying, <laughs> really, is I know I can be hard and still, tough. We still hot. We still hot. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, we still alive. This is oh, the part alive. that people love. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're still alive, darling. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk to those people over there. We but you know, this is the part that everybody loves. This but we didn't talk to the shares. people over there. Yeah, the real, real conversation. Okay, yeah. You know? This is the part you really want. Ha, ha, ha.